knowing this was going to be the series, um, when I got to preach, I really began to think a lot about one of the greatest interruptions in the Bible. And that would be the interruption that took the Jewish leader Saul and formed him into the Apostle Paul. Anybody familiar with that story? Some, some of you are? Well, good. Maybe, maybe this will be good today. Maybe you'll walk away with some knowledge. I'm going to hit you with some. So, anyways, but you got to see that, that Paul, he, he was very, th- this conversion was a, was a big deal. I mean, it changed the course of history, and it even had a huge impact on the Bible that we read today. Because you see, he wrote, he believed to have wrote, people like to argue, you know how they are, but he's believed to have wrote almost half of the New Testament. So could you imagine what would have happened if this interruption would have never happened in his life? Could you imagine the New Testament without half the books? Right? Be kind of maybe a little bit bland, but anyways. But like I said, I've been studying this over the last few weeks, and, and I just want to share a little bit of what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me in my studies. But first, let's pray so I can calm down, and we'll get right into this. But Lord, we just thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that I would just be able to deliver this word the way that it needs to be delivered, God, and that they would fall on open hearts today, and that they could take something with them and apply it to their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I gotta get a drink. (laughs) All right. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 9, and we'll, we'll start reading a little bit of this story. And then we will dive right into it. You know, it might take two or three hours to really get this to you. So I just want you to bear with me today. Um, some of you guys already know, like 20 minutes maybe, right? <laughs> Y'all, that was one of my best jokes today, and you guys aren't laughing. So, all right. This is going to be good. All right. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, starts like this. I'll be reading out of the Passion Translation today. During those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder disciples of the Lord Jesus. So he went to ask the high priest and requested a letter of authorization he could take to the Jewish leaders in Damascus, requesting their cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way. And that way, of course, being the way of Jesus Christ. Saul wanted to capture all of the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained the authorization and left for Damascus. Just outside the city, a brilliant light flashing from heaven suddenly exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless, for they heard a heavenly voice but could see no one. Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, the victorious, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city or you will be told what you are to do. Now talk about an interruption, right? Like you got this plan made out, you're going, and then boom, bright light from heaven comes, loud voice, you're on your butt on the road, and you can't see anything. Quite an interruption, right? Before we dive too far into that, though, I want you to get to know who Saul was a little bit. Because just like everybody, Saul had a past, right? We all have them. Some of them stink, right? That's okay. You got to see, Saul was a devout Jewish man, and he was, was very highly regarded in his arena. He even described himself later on in the book of Acts as being a zealous man, meaning that he was very, very passionate about his Jewish traditions and beliefs. He was actually referred to by his colleagues as being the Pharisee of Pharisees. So, like, basically, he was the best of the best of the religious folk, right? It's even crazy that the name Saul actually means sought after. It fits him so well, right? Because he was so good at what he does, what he did, that the other religious leaders were trying to live up to his standard. They were, he was the, the example for others to, to, to strive for. However, you know, he did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And as we've read, he's, he's seeking out to catch uh, Jesus' followers and imprison them. And even just, just a couple chapters before, he was actually an accomplice in the stoning of the first martyr named Stephen. So Saul, yeah, he, he had a past. 
But I want you to understand, don't just, don't just make him a bad guy just yet. You see, Saul was very good at what he was taught to do. Saul was very, very successful. You see, the fact that, that he even had some kind of authorization to go into Damascus and arrest these people, he was, he was well known. He was, he was successful. So I can just imagine him, and I tried to strut during the first service, and I didn't do very good, but I could just imagine him like strutting down the road. I wish I could do like a gangster walk or something. Because Paul, Saul kind of sounds like a gangster, right? He's like, I'm going to go get these guys. Anyways, he's just like strutting down the road like, I'm so successful. I got this document here. I'm going to go do some business. And then all of a sudden, boom, interruption. Knocked to the ground. Blind as a bat, they say. <laughs> What's my point in all this? Is you can, I want you to understand, you can be as successful as you can imagine. Like you can literally have the highest ranking job possible in your arena. You can own 10 houses and 20 cars. I could own 4,000 guitars, right? But you can still be avoiding your purpose. You see, my point is this. God is willing to interrupt your success for the sake of your purpose. Listen, he, Saul, Saul thought he was so good. He thought he was so successful. But in the, in the end, he was avoiding his purpose. God already knew what, what Saul would go on to be Paul and what Paul would do. So God is willing to interrupt your success for the sake of your purpose. Now, now one of the reasons I chose this story is because I can see a, a, a season of my life being very similar to Saul's. Now, don't get me wrong. I've never murdered anybody. I own guns, but I don't use them, okay? Not on anybody. So, so, yeah, no, I didn't do any of that, but my actions were being very... Uh, detrimental to the people that I love the most. And I just want to share a little bit about my testimony a little bit. So if you've heard it, I apologize, but there are a lot of people here I've never seen before, so they haven't heard it. But uh, I was once in a similar situation. Uh, About six years ago, uh, I had a, a, a massive interruption that came into my life, and it changed my life forever. Uh, as a matter of fact, if it would not have happened, I can almost guarantee you I wouldn't even be here standing here speaking to you today. That's how big of a deal it was. But my life, I've always been about music. I love, love, love music. I can remember starting to sing in church when I was maybe three, four years old. Like, I could barely even talk, and they had me, like, singing in a microphone. I know. (laughs) Prodigy, right? Uh, But anyways, in my early teens, I, I took up the guitar. My grandpa was a guitar player. I loved guitar, and he had a stroke and wasn't able to play, and my parents were like, oh, you need to learn to play. So I just grabbed it and, like, started teaching myself, and I fell in love with it. And, and so it was just a big part of my life. Funny thing is, I told the first services, too. I think it's funny looking back. My parents had, like, a dream for me to go play in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> That's right. Country music show. That's what they're like. You need to go try out. You're good enough. You can make it. I was not good enough, guys. I'm still not good enough. I don't even know what they were thinking, but you know how it is when it's your kids, they're always the best, right? My kids are the best. Um, let's just make that clear right now. They were supposed to sit out here and listen to their daddy today. So I don't know if they're out here, but you're the best. <laughs> but anyways, eventually I got this opportunity to play with this gospel group that I had, I had admired and looked up to for, for a long time. And of course I like jumped at it. I'm like, yes, like this is awesome. I'm going to get to go play guitar. And who knows, maybe one day I may make more than $100 a week playing it. Right? I'm making money. So, anyways. I, I do want to say, I didn't say this in the first service, the, the ministry that I joined, they are not at fault in any of this. I love them very much. They're still dear friends. But this is all about me, okay? Uh, so, anyways, it, at first it was very... Uh, very little. We would go maybe a couple times a month and go, and uh, I would play guitar at churches with this ministry. And then increasingly, increasingly, it got more and more. Like, I got to where I would leave Friday afternoon from work. I'd be gone Friday, Saturday. I'd come back Sunday morning to the home church, play, and then I would leave right after church and go somewhere else and play. And all this time, I was leaving my family behind. Um, my wife, she, uh, she dealt with it for a long time, <laughs> but... Um, not, not very long, so <laughs> anyways, but, but I can look back now, and I can see that, you know, like, I can think of back then and say, you know, I was, I, in that moment, I felt like I was making it, like, I was, I was successful, 
Like, I was getting to play guitar semi-professionally, right? I was making money doing it, so that's professional, right? Not much money, but I was making money. But I can think back there and, and just think about all that success that I thought I had. While, all, all the while, I was, I was tearing apart my family is what I was doing. You see, uh, I had an interruption hit. In about the span of about three weeks, my wife, I don't blame her, she left me. She's here today, so <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, uh, my wife left me. I was laid off of my job. And uh, because of being a stupid, young, <laughs> immature young man, uh, I didn't have a place to live. So even if we were together, we would have been sleeping in our car. Um, so, yeah, my actions kind of were messed up. But the interruption came. And, and over the... I'm sorry. Look <laughs> what I want you to understand. I'm so sorry. I got messed up. <laughs> what I want you to understand today is that, that God doesn't want you to be unsuccessful. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to prosper, and he wants you to have life and life more abundantly. But when you're avoiding your purpose, he's willing to interrupt your life. Amen. Just as he did with Saul. Saul thought he was doing exactly what he needed to do, but God said, hold up, you're not living out your purpose. Well, let's read on a little bit more. I'm going to slow down just a little bit. I'm trying to. Uh, Acts 9 again. We're going to go to verse 8 and read a little bit. So Saul stood to his feet. Even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind. So the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. For three days he didn't eat or drink and couldn't see a thing. Living in Damascus wasn't, was a believer named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling his name, Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias answered. The Lord said, go at once to the street called Abundance and look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. You will find him at Judah's house. While he was praying, he saw in a supernatural vision a man named Ananias coming to lay hands upon him to restore his sight. Now, as I was reading this, something caught my eye. I, I noticed that in verse 8, it said that Saul couldn't see anything. But yet, if you go down to verse 12, it says that he saw a supernatural vision. Now, I, I hope you all know in here that the Bible does not contradict itself. So I begin to look into that and see exactly maybe what was going on here. You see, Saul couldn't see anything that he may have wanted to see. You see, I, I can only imagine like trying to travel somewhere. And I don't know if Saul had ever been there before, but I would still want to see the road I was traveling, right? Like, you know, if you're walking down this road and there's a pothole, you might want to step to the side. Or there's a rock, you might want to step over so you don't trip. Or maybe even, maybe Damascus was like this beautiful place. Maybe the road there, there was like this beautiful scenery on each side. I don't know. I've never been there. But Saul, if he wanted to see that, he couldn't see any of it. You see, a lot of times, interruptions can be blinding. And you will struggle to see what's next. And it's frustrating when things like that happen. That you can't see what that next step is. You can't see the solution to the problem. You see, that doesn't mean, though, that God isn't willing to show you what it is you need to see. Write this down. Your inability to see gives God the opportunity to show. You see, even though Saul couldn't see anything with his physical eyes, God was willing to show him the answer to his problem, that being his blindness. You see, I'll go back to my story for just a little bit. Courtney leaving me blindsided me. And it, 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 it really woke me up. But I, I could not see what my next step was going to be. I couldn't see what my life would be without her. I didn't know where I was going to work or where I was going to live. So I went and moved in with my mommy. <laughs> and uh, she took care of me for a little bit. But I couldn't see what was next. But thankfully, in the next few weeks, God began to show me things I needed to do to make things right. You see, sometimes you may not be able to see, but you can still seek. I, I thought it was so awesome that 
that Saul blinded and on his butt, he didn't just sit there. Like, I don't know what I would have done. Like, I can't eat anything. I can't drink anything. I can't see. I'm just going to sit right here and do nothing. But Saul chose to seek out the answer that he needed. And luckily, these guys are with him that could help him get to where he was going. So I want to encourage you today, when you can't see, continue to seek. Because God is willing to show you what you need to see. All right, let's go on down and read a little bit more, starting in verse 13. But Lord, Ananias replied, many have told me about this terrible persecution, of his terrible persecution in those of those in Jerusalem who are devoted to you. I'll get it right in a minute. In fact, the high priest has authorized him to seize and imprison all those in Damascus who call your name. The Lord Yahweh answered him, Arise and go. I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. He will be brought before kings, before many nations, and before Jewish people to give them the revelation of who I am. And I will show him how much he is destined to suffer because of his passion for me. Ananias left and found the house where Saul was staying. He went inside and laid hands on him, saying, Saul, my brother, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me to pray for you so that you might see again and be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Then all at once the crusty substance that was over Saul's eyes disappeared and he could see perfectly. Immediately he got up and was baptized, and after eating a meal, praise the Lord, his strength returned. Within the hour he was in the synagogues preaching about Jesus and proclaiming, Jesus is the Son of God. Those who heard him were astonished, saying among themselves, Isn't this the Saul who furiously persecuted those in Jerusalem who called on the name of Jesus? Didn't he come here with permission from the high priest to drag them off and take them as prisoners? Saul's power increased greatly as he became more and more proficient in proving that Jesus was the anointed Messiah. Saul remained there for several days with the disciples, even though it agitated the Jews of Damascus. Now, now here we are. Saul has, has found the solution to his problem. He's found the whole reason for, for the interruption. But I want to go back just a little bit because I want to look at Ananias' uh, first reaction. I, I thought it was pretty cool that Ananias already knew everything there was to know about Saul. Like he knew this guy was a bad dude. And God's telling him, like, go find him out. Basically saying, go turn yourself in. Like if you're thinking in Ananias' mind, like go, go to this guy that wants to kill you and... Pray for him, right? And Ananias is like, but God, like this guy's bad. But I love God's reaction. He's very stern with Ananias. He says, arise and go, exclamation point. And then we have Ananias praying for Saul. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He regains his sight and he starts preaching the message of Christ. See, Saul's reputation had preceded himself. Like I said, Ananias knew everything there was to know about Saul. How many of you guys have had your reputation precede you? Anybody? Right? Good or bad. It doesn't have to be bad. But I was telling the first service, when I tell people my name, my name is Jason Roten, it's spelled like Ruffton, people automatically say, you must do dirt work. Do you own a backhoe? <laughs> and that's like, like for real. Like my, my name precedes myself. Precedes me. That's the right grammar. Uh, what am I trying to get at? Is look, even in the, with this case of Saul, it's just like this for you. Your past or reputation has no authority over your purpose. What I'm trying to say is that even though Saul had a horrible reputation in the new founded church, his purpose was still going to be unlocked by Ananias. Even though Ananias at first was reluctant, God was still willing to get to, he was still pushing him to unlock that purpose in him. So your past or your reputation has no authority over what your purpose is. You see, it's important to realize 
that just as God spoke to Jeremiah in the Old Testament, when he said, Jeremiah, even before I formed you in your mother's womb, I set you apart for a purpose. He set him apart to be a, a great prophet to the nations. Just as he did that with Jeremiah, he's done that for each and every one of you. See, he, before any of you guys were formed in your, in your mom, God literally put a purpose on your life. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care who you were. You still have purpose in your life. And as I was finishing up my studies last night, God spoke this to me, and I just thought it was so profound. And he said this, that even though your reputation may precede you, your purpose preceded your reputation. Meaning that you have, you're here, you're formed with purpose. Then you have all this junk in the middle, your past and your reputation, but it has nothing to do with you still fulfilling your purpose. Listen, this place right here, this church, if you are here, you're going to find out, if you're new, you're going to find out that this church is about purpose. We are about helping you meet Jesus and living out your purpose. So, Pastor Brian, I'm, I'm a good example, he will make you live out your purpose. That's why I'm up here today. I'm enjoying it, don't get me wrong, but he will challenge you in living out your purpose. Because, you see, your purpose has more of an impact on things around you then you realize your purpose isn't just for you. It's for the kingdom. If you're not living out your purpose, there's a lot of things that may not take place. Just like Saul, if he didn't encounter Jesus on the road to Damascus, how much would we be, we be missing? How many people on those missionary trips would have never been spoken to, would have never been told the word of God? How many books in the Bible would we be missing? Now, sure, God could have found somebody else to do it, but what if? What if he didn't live out his purpose? What if he chose not to embrace that interruption on the Damascus Road and to truly live out his purpose? You see, Saul would eventually go on to be known as the Apostle Paul, as we know. And I wish I had some kind of amazing story and God's like, you're going to call yourself Paul from now on. But actually, in chapter 13, it just comes to a verse and it says, Now Saul, who is also known as Paul, and then he's just called Paul for the rest of the Bible. So I don't have like this crazy way of telling you why he started being called Paul. But at the end of the day, he wasn't living out of his purpose, but now he is. And that's what I want you to understand today. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your reputation is. I don't care how successful that you think you are. You were made for purpose.